I'm going to ask for our elders who are going to be on this panel to come up here to the stage. Um, so we are going to be joined by Leon. I mean, we're so lucky to have Leon continue to join us. I am so appreciative of his knowledge. Every single year, I was telling him earlier, I grew Hopi sunflowers, and I think about his family every single time. So um, Leon, having uh, Beverly come back, uh, again, she's I just so appreciate being able to be in this space with her. Um, Lenora Cook from Swinomish Indian Tribal Community to come join us. We're going to have Ernie Whiteman, the cultural director of Dream of Wild Health in Minnesota. And I haven't seen him this year. I got to hang out with him last year. And then Hope Flanagan, from, she's the wild foods educator at Dream of Wild Health in Minnesota. So um, they're going to be joining us up here. And Linda Frizzell, who I'm so excited to have us join as part of this um, panel. So if you could all just want to come up, grab a seat, go ahead and take a seat here. And as they're coming up, um, again, I want to thank um, my dear friend Itai for sharing that story and that song with us and to remind us that this work is also spiritual. There's um, in the interior of Alaska, if I have to fly into Anchorage to get to my home, which is about six hours away, there's this place that you drive outside of Anchorage to get into the interior of Alaska. And there's a little pull-off, and there's always all these tourists there, and they're big old motorhomes and rental cars, and they're out there taking pictures of a glacier you can see from that pull-off. Well, the pull-off is also full of a bunch of Indians, Alaska Native folks, Athabascans specifically, who are leaving food in one area while all the tourists are taking pictures in that same pull-off. And we're all looking at each other like, you're weird. <laughs> why are you taking pictures? And they're like, why are you leaving food? And we always leave a spirit plate for that mountain that is there, the, the woman who carries her child on her back. Because that is our responsibility when we pass that place to honor it and to leave food. And that is part of our spiritual practice. And so thank you, Itai, for that continuous reminder that this work is... Um, also spiritual and deeply, deeply important for us to remember those teachings. We have an incredible panel here today, and um, I'm just going to maybe just start right here. We'll go down the line and um, have you introduce yourselves, and then maybe just give some thoughts and perspectives on what you've seen over here in the, the past couple of days, and maybe some thoughts that you'd like to share with the overall group. If you have any questions of our elders panel, please go into the pigeonhole and put that in, and we will also ask them those questions. But I just want to, I just want to hear all of your thoughts. It's so nice to see you, Ernie. Aho, buju nintene we magani duk, nunde nanti kwe indiko. Hope indigenous kazama jaganashi mo win. Make knock din do dem. Tao wandish kona gining in dem jaba. Make wago in gine de manga kina we a we pia jaye ge manungum. Ni we pagadinami o a sema anzamgi we a ne de man. Kena mani do we piss into wago we gine shwa jichke yang nungum. I just want to recognize all the unseen ones that are here with us. When I uh, say this, Buju Nindinwe Magani Duk, that old way of saying that is, hello, all my different kinds of relatives. Might be humans, might be a little ant crawling around on the, on the floor over there. I'm grateful that you're here. I'm grateful that you all are doing the work that you're doing here. Uh, we brought some teenagers here yesterday from Dream of Wild Health. And uh, we're hoping to spur on that young generation to see the good work that you're doing, that you're working for our communities and trying to do the good. Um, our director from Dream Wild Health is here right now. We have a 10 acre farm. Uh, last year we grew um, 7.6 tons of food to go back into our communities. There's some, I get a chance to work with this wonderful man right here by my side. and listen to him pray and talk to the young ones, the teenagers and the, even the younger ones, the uh, school age young ones around the fire every morning in the summer while we're teaching them about raising the, the foods, our old foods. Um, really grateful that we get an opportunity to do that at the Drew Wild Health Farm. And uh, grateful to be here and see other elders here that are speaking with them. Um, I was, had a chance to do a walk uh, with uh, the plants at the very beginning on Sunday. And I brought 15, no, 14 different plants to try. And four of them were nuts. They're, they're from right around here. 
wild plants that are growing, especially along the river. There's old campsites down there, Dakota campsites, where the plants are still coming back. They're waiting for us. They're food for us. They're waiting for us to come back and honor them by receiving their gift of food, medicine, or utility, and always that gift of breath. But I have a worry in that, like, four of them were nuts, and now with our kids, uh, I'm supposed to go to a school tomorrow, I can't bring those relatives, I can't bring those nuts because of environmental illness. So we've got to make sure that there's clean food, clean water, clean air, that those young ones can take in those clean things, those gifts that we have. You know, we watch over that environment so those things are still there. I don't mean to be negative right away, but I want to lift that up. That in our old way of seeing, you look at everything, the whole picture. The air, the water, the insects, the animals. So, miigwech, bizen dao yeg. Thank you for listening. And that half, pass on. Pass it on. Hope it will pass on yet. <laughs> Not right now, at least. <laughs> I must be afterlife. <laughs> yeah, some days I feel like that, you know, but uh, I'm blessed to be here. Um, I'm, very, I'm very honored to be here. Um, my name is Tate Bae, and uh, in my, in my, uh, with my people, the Hinane, the Northern Arapaho, uh, that name was given to me by my great-grandfather, Charlie Whiteman, and it means strong old man. And uh, as, I've, as I've gone on through the years, I've realized how important our names are, the names that we were given. There's a meaning behind every name that you were given. And if you don't know, ask someone that gave you that name what that means, and you will know what you are supposed to do in your life. So with that name, I know what I have to do. You know, I have to, I have to uh, be an elder and be on panels, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know? But I have to be around a long time, you know, because we have a lot of young people coming up. And that's what I do. Uh, that's what my purpose in life is right now, is to work with our people, our young people, our communities. And it's so important. You know, right here we have a community. We've formed a community, all the people here. We are all one family. We are all concerned about our people. We're all concerned about our communities. We're concerned about our health. We're concerned about our elders, our youth, everything. And that's the concept that I teach is the, the circle of life, how everything is connected in this circle. We all are part of it. And as Hope said, even those little animals, those little creatures that crawl on the earth, they are part of that. Everything above us, everything here, we are all connected. So I'd like to, I'd like to uh, talk about the conference, you know, um, a little bit. And there is so much wisdom and knowledge here. It's unbelievable. Um, and I'm so glad that our Native people are curious people, or we wouldn't be here. We all want to learn. We all want to understand what it is that we need to do for our communities. Um, I can't stress enough the food. That's one of the things that we do is we raise organic food. We teach the young people how to raise their own food. Uh, what good is food if you can't cook it, right? <laughs> so we teach them how to cook. We're very fortunate to work with a chef uh, that comes to the farm uh, every day, teaches our young people how to cook. Um, we do, we try to cover as much as we can in the short amount of time that we have in the summer. Um, we have a wonderful staff. Um, I, I'm very fortunate to work here with Hope Flanagan, um, excellent forager, excellent lady. Um, we have a crew of about what? 14 people. I remember when I started, there were only three people. We would sit at a little table and have a, a staff meeting. Now we number 14 people. 
So we're growing. We're a growing organization, you know. And I think we, you know, to me, the youth are the, are the future. They are our future. At one time, we were young. We all were young, you know. I always have to remind the kids, I said, you know, I, I haven't always been an old person. I was, I was, I was young once, you know. <laughs> and uh, they kind of look at me and they say, yeah, I guess so, you know. But I was, you know, I was young and I was, I was, I made mistakes like young people do. But somebody has to teach them. Somebody has to teach our youth, you know. And so that's what we do. Uh, we work very closely with them. And with all this knowledge and wisdom that has been shared here at this conference, I'm able to extract things. I'm able to utilize information. I'm able to take that information back and incorporate that, incorporate that information into whatever I'm doing, you know? And so I want to thank all of you. I want to thank everybody here that we're able to contribute and share with all of us your wisdom and your knowledge. You know, it's very important that we continue doing this as Native people, you know. We've, we've been under that uh, divide and conquer mentality for a long time. And we have to break away from that. That's part of the illness, what we're recovering from. We've lost connections with each other. We don't have those connections that we used to have. I remember my grandmother would be traveling and uh, she was going from Wind River to Pine Ridge, South Dakota. And I asked her, what, what are you going there for? She said, I'm going to make new relatives. So that's what you're all doing here. You're all making new relatives, you know, and we all, we all have the same concerns, you know, about everything. Um, one of the things, too, about food, you know, I was thinking about this the other day and I had a discussion with Hope about this. I said, but we don't look at ourselves as food. I said, of course, we always are told we're on the food chain, but we don't see ourselves as food. I said, if you think about it, we planted those seeds. Those seeds gave us crops gave us food, the animals. We hunt the animals. We eat the animals, we eat the food. We become that food. We become that food that we eat. So in essence, we are a product of what we eat. We are the food. The old saying is, you are what you eat. That's true. So if you eat healthy, if you have a good diet, you're, you're gonna be a good you're going to be good food, all right? So remember that. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I'm going to pass it on here. So thank you. Thank you. OCO, my Indian name is Wabi Guinash. My uh, English name is Linda Bain Frizzell. Uh, I'm, I'm really honored to be on the stage with all these uh, very distinguished elders and the distinguished elders uh, also in the audience and uh, the other folks, and, and in particular, the youth. Uh, I work at the University of Minnesota, and uh, some of the stories that were shared this morning, I, I, just, I just like exactly what goes on. Uh, the University of Minnesota is a land-grant university in this state along with the tribal colleges, and a lot of folks at the university don't understand that. And quite honestly, and I have to be careful what I say because I, I rather like working there, but uh, uh, regardless, uh, <laughs> It's been a bit of a struggle, uh, specifically to, to help folks to understand what the government-to-government -government relationship is. It, it, it's, just, it's just beyond belief. And so whenever you get into a situation, which most universities have, the, the, uh, the saying is, uh, publish or perish, well, that puts pressure on people. But in the same sense, it isn't fair to our communities. I was a clinic director for uh, a lot of years for a tribe up north of here, and I used to get calls, oh yeah, well, we're coming up to the reservation next week, you won't even know we're here. And I'm like, uh, I don't know what to say, the first time it happened. And so my, I say, well, what would be the benefit to my community? And dead silence, no clue. 
And, and so that's, that's the reputation that universities struggle with. And, you know, tribes have, a lot of tribes have their own uh, institutional review boards now, the IRBs, and I think there's some real progress going on there. I know there's other people at the university that we're working to work through that because our goal is, with at least 11 tribes in this, federally recognized in this state, to have them ask us. If, they, if we could help them, that's the goal. We don't want to push our agenda. It is the stakeholders. And so whenever participatory commu community participatory research came in uh, to effect many, many years ago, still the same thing. People came in and, and while they, they use the acronym that, yeah, well, this is community involved, community may be a couple token uh, memberships on a respective board. That's evolving now. That's evolving in such a good way that it's always 51% if you have an advisory board that are local folks. And, and I see a lot of progress being made, and we do owe that to, uh, to our uh, 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 folks. And I wanted to, to make a, a, a brief comment uh, on the, the, the uh, co Crow uh, Reservation uh, presentation. You've you got to get on a PBS or something <laughs> and share that because that model is super. And so the more often that we can do that, I used to use a, a pedagogy called service learning uh, in this state and, and other states. And what I see happening whenever you acknowledge students, youth, and by the way, we have a young adult on this planning committee for this conference, but whenever you acknowledge them, it validates them. And that validation is so important. Think about it. My youngest is... Uh, 33, and I swear to goodness, if he would have been the firstborn, he'd been the only child. But, uh, <laughs> but regardless, my, my oldest is uh, 10 years older. But he's been a bit of a challenge. But I, I've seen a, a tremendous change in the, in the youth uh, in this country. And so as elders, it is our responsibility uh, to help. And everybody here in the room and on this, on this stage uh, would agree. Uh, we have responsibilities, and we gladly accept those. Sometimes uh, from some uh, very traditional families, uh, and I, was, I wasn't allowed to ask. I had to be there, and if an elder uh, saw me sitting there, if they asked me a question, that was okay, but I couldn't ask him. So what I'm urging people to do if you get in that particular scenario, give the youth permission to, to speak. Let them talk with you because you have so much knowledge uh, that can be shared. So uh, once again, I just really endorse uh, 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 at least what we're doing at the university uh, here and uh, good things on the forefront. And I think the, um, the uh, collaboration, I, I like that term better than partnership. It's a little easier in communities to collaborate, well, certainly legally, but uh, uh, to reach out to our communities because they need help. And that is our responsibility as a land-grant institution. So um, anyhow, that's all I have to say right now. I'll pass it on. I've got one. Hello? Good morning. Good <laughs> Ita me mo ita sin ma mga me happy lulmat kacit happy ao pasio na yan yan happy ita mo happy a ao na yak ovi tampan kya kya ang halay kya kya ang piu a ho ita kiki ang happy yes ban ang ita yes we pe pa kam ita ita kiki e pa kam it lulmat kacit pas ansa ao yuri kya ni nen ita me pa kam pa po ho hong with happy yes ban I just express my gratitude for people that are still here with us this morning and that I'm glad that you're here. I appreciate you being here and also that what knowledge that we have learned today that you would transfer that knowledge to your communities and to put that into use and action so that at the community level, at the individual level, they will put that and acknowledge that and understand that and put that to use in making everybody healthy today. It's, uh, my first language was Hopi. And I went through that process like every one of us, I guess that, <clears throat> excuse me, 
that uh, attended boarding school, uh, that attended school. In history, in 1906, the village of Oribe was split. Oribe was one of the largest Hopi villages. When they carbon dated some of the in, uh, um, uh, artifacts from that village, they carbon dated that to 900 AD. And the elders said they didn't dig far enough. If they dig, if they dig far enough, they're going to find out that this village was established long before 900 AD. I just recently read a report that they now discovered an ancient ancestral village that dates to six, six million years ago. It predates what they had found in Africa as one of the oldest communities. And that community is, is, in, Northern, is in North America. So it, it's, it appears, it, it feels, it's, uh, I don't know, it sounds, it verifies, I guess, what the, the elders, my elders have, have said about how long have the Native Americans been here in North America. We have, Hopi has ties to South America that we always talk about in our creation story, our migration stories. And we are, our dialect is of the Aztecs, Mayan language, the Hopi language. And I think the connection that we need to make is that the transfer of knowledge from the elders to our youth today is critical. They need to know about life and the reason why we have our ceremonies that we have across the Native American population. There are bits and pieces of it here. It's not all complete. But I think if we sit down with our elders and ask the questions that they will share this knowledge with us. Just from the ceremonies, I belong to two religious ceremonies on Hopi. And I was inducted or initiated into those religious uh, ceremonies when I was about 40, maybe 50 years old, 40 maybe. And just from learning from the ceremonies that are conducted I made an immediate attachment to the, the songs that were being sung as a part of the prayers. This lady that sang this morning, I made an immediate connection to that song and what, what I felt from it. And those songs are sung in those, in those, in those religious ceremonies not only of the Native American, but in, in uh, like in Tibet. You've heard them, you, I've heard the songs from the monks when they sing, and they sing in a low, real low tone, and it vibrates. Vibration touches the heart. Your body reacts to sound, and the vi vibration from that sound and the lowest, the lower sounds they are, they begin to vibrate with your heart and your organs and your cells. So the songs that are sung, at least within our Native American religious prayers that are said, it resonates within us, but it also resonates with those that are living around us. We're just talking about nature. Plants vibrate at a certain, with a certain sound. And it revitalizes them. It revitalizes my heart for those participants that are in that ceremony. Even prayer vib makes a part of your body vibrate. 
especially when this prayer is sung or in, is said in a, in a song-like prayer. The other thing I wanted to uh, share with you about research is that we have uh, the research that we've been, the information that we're gathering from the research today, there's still another realm of research that needs to be done. And that is the religious portion that we need to document and to show that the religious portion of Native American is that that needs to be verified through research. But I, I think that the research model that we're using is not, not the right fit. It's not going to be able to do the job. And that's where I think our challenge is now. The universities, the Native American researchers that we have today need to change the research model that we're using to capture the knowledge that's there from the religious part of who we are as Native Americans. I watched a movie, I saw a movie that was uh, entitled Seven... I can't remember what the what the name of it was, but there were seven events that were going to be that was going to happen, and those seven events would lead up to the um, extension of life. Ex, did I say it right? <laughs> life was going to end if seven of these events occurred. I was watching that movie, and there's one one portion of that movie that came out to me and that I, that I caught on to. He said, in the Jewish religion, in, the, in their Bible, they say that there's a place where the breath of life exists. And the breath of life is regenerated, revitalized through the par- prayers that are made with the Jewish people, that the songs that they sing, the prayers that they make, it revitalizes that, that place where the breath of life exists. It's called the guff. It's called the guff. That's where the breath of life exists. And when a child is born, the breath of life comes from that guff and is given to the infant. The first breath of life that the infant breathes comes from that and it's delivered. And you know who delivers that breath of life and sees it? Well, not deliver, but you know who sees the breath of life coming down to the child? It's the canaries. The canaries sing when they see the breath of life coming down to that child. And the first breath they take comes from the guff. It was very interesting because I made that connection right away because of what I was taught, what I learned in one of those ceremonies, religious ceremonies that we have. And that part of the research, I don't know if there's going to be a research model that's going to show that. <laughs> but I, my, my hope is that someday we can prove that that really happens. I think some of the things that we talk about here, we learn from our culture and from our teachings, but it's kind of hard to to verify and, and to show, but that's what our youth today need to learn about. So the advance that we've made in the research in Native American, in Native America, that needs to change so that we can be able to show the young kids today, this is where it is. This is where this plant grows. This is what that plant has the medicine to cure this illness that you have. We should be able to say that. We can't say that today. Why? Because we don't have enough evidence to prove that. So I'm just uh, sharing this with you because I I thought that this is something that, that we really need to look at. And you're right. We are a community and we have to learn how to transfer the positive energy to the next person. We have positive energy and that's transferred when I touch her 
that's transferred to her. And you always have to think positive. There's too much negativity out there. You have to be positive within your life, with individuals that you speak with, and that positive energy goes from you to that individual. I just want to leave that with you. Thank you. Oh, I just love all of you guys. H um, Adelza, Stetya, Tsitsta, Swadabs, Swinamish. My name is Lenora Cook, English name. And um, I am just so honored to be here. This is my first conference. Um, our, within the program, I don't actually work in our program, but um, I have been attending and um, attending all of our workshops and getting my children involved and um, just participating, kind of the way my grandparents and great-grandparents would have, you know, gone out foraging, um, coming home, uh, food preservation, um, fishing, and um, then teaching my daughters. So that's kind of how I've ended up here. And um, so it's just been a really wonderful experience and watching all the younger people are the next generation young adults. Um, they've got their eyes wide open and are just... Um, absorbing everything and it seems they're doing it with such respect I think and whenever they can I'm sure are um, working with elders I mean we have that in our in in our program uh, we we invite our elders to come and um, and are really providing a lot of this knowledge as much as we can and getting it out into the community um, the best we can but to have this knowledge right here, and I mean, I have so much to learn, we all have so much to learn, and we can't lose that, but I'm just excited, and um, there's a lot of hope, I think, for the future with our next generation coming up. Um, I think that in hearing all the stories, um, like with my mother, my, my daughter, um, she had the internship with our program, with our tribe this last summer, and it really prompted, she's in college, she's gonna be a senior and graduating, but all the experiences and the stories that they've heard, um, the suffering and the pain and the trauma, I think that they've embraced it in a different way, and, and um, so not only when they, think about fighting for their ancestors, they can just look right next to them and see their grandmothers or their grandfathers. And that gives them the louder voice, the, the strength um, to be able to see that and just oh, want to just move forward and try to get out there and get those educations and talk with, you know, bigger government leaders to um, protect protect our treaties, protect our, our lands, our natural resources. And so I'm just really excited to, to have witnessed all of this here. And, you know, we do need to add the spirituality and the prayer, um, you know, to this whole program. And I think that this is a real complete um, full circle in the way that uh, we're all really approaching everything here. So again, I'm just really honored to be here and just love everything that I'm hearing. You know, it's, it's amazing. So. Good morning, my name is uh, Sita Woman. That was my first name. That was given to me at the time of my birth. And, and later, when they had to do the birth certificate, they had to find another name. <laughs> so my name is Beverly, and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, again, honored, just like the rest of the panel verbalized. I'm honored to be here as uh, elder. 
I work with youth because I work at SDSU College of Nursing in Rapid City. And uh, the majority of them I, that I've talked to this semester know I'm here. And they're curious because I get so excited about, because I was here the past two years and I talk about this conference in terms of the inclusiveness and the, the knowledge that is shared, not just from the Western way of learning, but our traditional ways. It's good to share all that with everyone because we all come from different cultures and this is a way to learn about others, other ways of being, other ways of knowing, and uh, validate that with each other. And this is what this conference does. The way it's, it's uh, planned, inclusive of age groups, and the way the researchers are coming up here with such caring and sense of respo responsibility. You, you feel it with every one of them that they so much want to do the right thing. And I think they are. I think all of them have this great ability to teach everyone about what we can become as indigenous people and as people generally. And I'm not just speaking about one group, I'm speaking globally. We know what's happening on our planet. And all of us have a responsibility to do something. It, it's, you can't change everything, but you can change whatever you're able to do in your own communities. If, if it's teaching the youth, do it. If it's mentoring, we, we all know how to, to pass on what we know. And that's our responsibility, especially as we become older and have accumulated life experience and knowledge and understanding to pass it on. And uh, I have the opportunity to do that every day at my workplace because I work with all these young native students who are caring, first of all, because they all want to be nurses and who want to do for others. And that extends beyond getting educated. It's actually making a difference for their own people, families and communities. And they have a way of global thinking, I think, because of today's media and how much more we know uh, generally about the world and what's happening. And so when students come to me, I, I meet with them during the mentoring sessions, and they say, uh, I don't know what's happening in the world. I get so distressed when I think about it. And I said, well, don't, don't go into that place. Think positive, just like one of our panelists said, think positive. You can make a difference in your world. And if every one of us have that attitude that we can make a difference in our own world, in our own places, that, that should proliferate out to others because the more you show positive hopefulness to others, it's catching. I see a, a difference in students when they go through our program from the beginning and then when they're just about ready to graduate, it's like wonderful to see the maturity, the way they've developed, not only in knowledge, but understanding of what they can do personally and professionally to help change our world. Isn't this just an incredible group of people? We're so lucky and blessed to have your knowledge here on the stage. And um, that we had one question, and I think it's a really great question, that came through for all of you, and I've, um, 
hopefully it's coming up on the screen, but it's one that I think is really important because we do have a lot of non-Native people who work within our communities and they're really great allies and they have the best of intentions. And very often they'll hear you have to include the elders, but they don't know what that means sometimes. Um, it's a different value system that we're so lucky to have maintained in our communities. And I think everybody's world cultures had that value system, but it got lost. And we've been really fortunate to be able to hold on to that and can teach people and what it means. So it would be really great if maybe um, if you guys just wanted to touch on what you learned from your elders. Oh, um, I'm really grateful this uh, question came up because it, it's so easy to think, oh, I'm going to get information from, I'm going to do this. We're humans. We got to get outside of those cubes and walk around and look around. Uh, I know this summer with Ernie, I, I'm so grateful I get to work with him. I said, hey, see those giant swallowtails? If you Google this, they don't, they're not here. <laughs> they're just not here. But I see them. I've seen like 10 of them, you know. Oh, if you Google eastern hognose snakes, they're not here. But I saw them mating down by the river, you know. Oh, Woodland, uh, Woodland, Minnesota box turtles, they don't even exist, but I had one in my lap, you know. So uh, don't always think that Googling something and that way of learning science is the best way. In fact, I know two astrophysicists that have come to me and said, I need to learn the Ojibwe language because it explains physics that you can't understand in English. So sometimes you think, oh my gosh, uh, we have this way, we have this model, we have to follow this model. Sometimes you have to remember that you're human. Get outside this box, get outside, look at what's out there, look at those plants. Um, when Linda Black Elk and I were walking around, I really wanted to see, you know, it was it, to how she talked about all those plants out there on Sunday morning. Uh, Sunday morning, I talked about the plants and she talked about the plants and we both got stumped by this one plant. I said, I don't even know this plant. <gasps> I don't even know this plant. So I just love how she's like that night. She Googles me and I'm busy trying to find out what plant is this? What plant is this? We found out it was a Dakota healing plant. So uh, sometimes our elders, our relatives aren't in human form. They're insects, they're birds, they're animals, they're plants. You know, spend time with them, get to know one, and they're healing. Spend time, even if there's just one, you're walking out in the woods and you feel one that says, me, me, pay attention to me. Get quiet and spend time with that plant. Maybe you're just getting to know one plant. Um, those are kind of teachings you're probably not going to find with a lot of young people. So some of these, I, I'm so glad when we have young people and I see some of them in the audience that we see at the farm that ask questions like that, that'll bring tobacco and say, I want to know this. But uh, people get used to this rapid paced life where you want an instantaneous message or, or we're going to work with the kids at 15 minute, 15 minute chunks and you better be quiet because we, we now have to move on to the next chunk. Like, wait a minute, this is a story. <laughs> us, all, us elders we get going and it's like, this story evolves and it's a long story. Uh-oh, my 15 minutes are up and I only got to the... <laughs> First three words. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, it's a different way of being in the world. Um, and there's a lot of knowledge. There's a lot. Oh my gosh. I love listening to Ernie. That's the first part of my day. My best part of my day is listening to him pray and to get quiet and to feel that calm and that joy and that gratitude for being on this generous, generous Mother Earth giving us water, air, seeds, all this beautiful, beautiful Earth that we get to live on and be thankful for. Um, it's all around us. And if we get quiet enough, slow down enough, and listen, they talk to us. I remember when Ernie had asked me if, about finding wild potatoes. This, uh, uh, in science, they say Apios Americana. But we never called it that, you know. We called it hopness, little potatoes. 
And then this other uh, Potawatomi elder, same thing, she asked for those wild potatoes. So I'm walking along and I'm going by an old uh, Dakota Ojibwe campsite and I walk right past and I go, oh, something just called me and I look down, there goes those wild potatoes. Then last week I'm driving around, oh, there goes those wild potatoes, our old food, lots of them. They restore the earth, they put their legumes, they revitalize the nutrition in the soil. We've got to think like that because uh, even in our seed wing at Dream Wild Health, we have all these beautiful ancestral seeds that were protected and cared for by our, our elders that were before us. But if you take that beautiful seed that's so full of niacin and protein and uh, really good on the glycemic index and really good with uh, antioxidants and you stick it in this soil that has been treated for maybe 50 years growing corn with no nutrients, no love, no care. And here it maybe even has GMO tilled in to the soil from the toxins of its stalks. That poor corn had to grow like that. You stick that little beautiful little native seed in there, it can't give its gift. It just can only have what it came with, but you've got to feed it fresh water, clean water, clean soil, clean air, because it wants to give its gift too. But we've got to think of how we're going to take care of those too. Those, feed, those seeds are precious and living beings. We have a new seed keeper and she teaches me all the time. She says, uh, when you look at a cob of corn, that first third is for the insects, the deer, the raccoons, all the other li living beings. That middle section is for seed. That last section is for the humans to eat. We can't be so greedy that, oh, we're gonna grow corn and soybeans over all of Minnesota and say, oh, we're just gonna feed it to the pigs and the cows. What are we thinking about, you know? And then we're gonna till all these toxins that were broken into the genetic code and put right into the, right into the plant so that we can earn more money. Are we gonna eat money? Are we gonna breathe money? Are we gonna drink money? We've gotta think about that. How, miigwech. Aho, aho. Yeah, if you uh, ever go foraging with hope, um, don't plan on going a long journey. <laughs> she can walk uh, 20 yards and find all these plants and spend hours out there looking at these plants. And so it's very fortunate that we have hope to pass on this knowledge to our young people, you know. Um, some of this knowledge, you know, um, a lot of us grew up not knowing, you know. Um, Many of us grew up in a generation of uh, fast food. Uh, we grew up with all the processed foods, you know. I always blame the TV dinner for that. Think about that, you know. The TV dinner divided our families up. You could eat roast beef and, and mom could eat fish, dad could eat chicken. You could eat anywhere you wanted in the house. You didn't have to eat together. So I always say, I always blame all that stuff on, uh, on uh, that type of meal, you know. It's, we got away from our traditional ways of eating. So on the farm, when we eat with the young people, we sit in a circle. We put all our tables and chairs in a circle every day when we eat our lunch so that we have, we have that sense of family. We have that sense of community. And this is one of the ways that we reinforce these teachings know, as elders, is to show the kids, you know, and be part of it, not just talk, talk to them and teach them, but practice them and showing them these ways, you know, <clears throat> and, um, you know, I was just looking at this, is this the questions here? <laughs> sort of, yeah. sort of, okay, I was thinking, well, I better, I better stick to the questions here, um, but uh, one of the, it is very important to listen to elders, I notice all of you are listening, thank you. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it's very important to include our young people. You know, um, I've noticed, I've noticed, uh, and I've been ba uh, asked by various schools to be part of 
their programming so that they could have an elder, so that they could have someone to talk to those children. Because today in our society, we've severed that. The society, not we as Native people, but society has severed that relationship between the elders and the young people. So there's no dialogue going on. The young people are afraid to talk to the elders. Mm -hmm. The elders are afraid to talk to the young people. It shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't have to be that way. We as elders are willing to teach many elders. Um, I always tell the kids there are two kind of people that get older. There's old people and there's elders. The old people are the ones that are grouchy and don't want to share anything. <laughs> we probably know a few of those. <laughs> elders are the ones that share. So we're fortunate. We have all elders here today, you know. And uh, so it's very important, I think, to reconnect. Uh, what good is it to uh, li uh, listen to an elder if there's no elder there? You know, we need to create that relationship again with our young people. And that's what I try to do every day is create that bond with the young people and bring that back. And that's the original way of our people, all our people. I don't care what nation you're from. Our elders are the ones that pass on the knowledge and the wisdom. So it's very important, you know, that we do listen to our elders, but to include, to include. Um, and another question there was uh, several non-native community members whose traditions may not follow this. Um, I think this is our role um, to educate. We've been educated by the system for so long, you know. Um, the system has taught us many things, how to think linear, um, how to... Uh, do things different than we traditionally did. And that's how we survive. We survive that way today. But I think we have to reverse that. And it's the same way with research. We have to find the mechanism. We have to find that way. And so one of the ways I feel is to educate the non-community members about your culture and let them know that before they even come to work for you. You don't do it while they're working. You do it before, and you know if that person is sincere. And I think it's the same way with research. You investigate, you check the credentials of people. We've all had our credentials checked, right? <laughs> we all have an ID to tell us who we are, you know? So why can't we do the same thing? We have the same right. You know, we can do that also. So I think that, you know, uh, the importance again of youth and elders, to me, is the vital point of everything we do. A uh whole. -huh. Well, uh, I just want to say that whenever I was a youngster, I grew up in a very conservative family. And as I mentioned, I was taught to be seen and not heard. But most importantly, I was also taught whenever an elder told me to do something, that I must do it, not to question, even though I pretty much knew that I knew more. But, but, uh, <laughs> but regardless, the best thing was that elders are always correct. So there you go. And so I grew up with that, and I, I think it uh, helped me to um, uh, develop my values uh, of respect and so on. And, and so it was harsh. Uh, I do appreciate that. I don't see cohorts of folks, uh, at least I was born in 1950. Um, there's getting to be less and less folks that have had that sort of exposure. But I, I wanted to just briefly mention what Beverly was talking about. I teach a class, and it's going on tonight, uh, an American Indian uh, Wellness uh, Administration talks about laws and, and different uh, uh, legislations and so on. I truly am shocked and appalled. My students, and this is going on the second year, have no clue, some of them, that American Indians even exist. 
I've had stories from previous students at a different institute where her, uh, uh, the, it's a distance ed, where the, uh, uh, the student talked about her daughter who was five, uh, no, eight years old, and it was Heritage Week, and so everybody got to talk about their heritage, and of course, you know, um, her daughter shared about her um, Indian heritage, and you know what the teacher said? Oh, no, that can't be right. There aren't Indians anymore. I got goosebumps telling that story. And I teach a class in cultural humility, and I, I share that uh, right up front. But what it's taught me is that, uh, as my elders had told me, because I'm just always concerned that the history is so mythized that we don't know the answers. And the history is told by the winners. If you think about that a little bit, it makes a lot of sense. And so it's our responsibility uh, as elders, as college professors, whatever, to help share that. So my students, I start them off. Uh, I've, I've been a licensed teacher for 47 years, so anyhow, there's ways to do things. Sometimes it's a little challenging. But uh, regardless, uh, I've had to adjust without fail each class that I've taught at the university uh, to meet my students' needs. And so tonight, we'll be going over some things after write an analysis on things that they didn't quite perceive correctly. But in the end, and the evaluations I get at conclusions of, of classes, they're, they're so grateful. They're so respectful. And so it's just more folks that understand what the actual truth is. And that's what we need to share. There's so many myths I've been discriminated against so many times. I, I mean, I could just tell you all the assimilation stories and everything. Uh, it, it just isn't right. But, you know, I don't dwell on the negative. As teachers, professors, community leaders, it's our responsibility to help folks to understand what our history is. And, and, and we need to build from there. Right now, it's sort of like a, a hiatus. You're just sort of like floating around, nobody knows. And so I think that's why uh, our youth today often struggle because they're unable to ground themselves. Some of the tragedies we've had in, in our tribal communities, uh, mass suicides and so on, the only way that the community was healed was they had a medicine person or a spiritual person come in and help the community to heal by grounding them. And so that spiritual part of our, our heritage is so important. And people need to know how to interface that. And it basically leads to cultural humility, respect, and so on that we must have for every person on this earth. And so uh, I enjoy teaching, uh, a little challenging. But uh, like I say, it, it is important that we start to help people, especially in public health. Uh, all the public health departments in this country, there's hardly any people that are even aware there's Indian tribes. The uh, Centers for Disease Control block grant dollars to states. Tribes don't get any money for that. So using a preventative uh, model, which is what we've always used in, in Indian country, a holistic approach to life, uh, that's what we need to promote because our medical model is not making it. And so we need, we need to use that holistic. I'll get off my bandwagon. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'll follow up with that too also. But... Uh, just to give you some historic information, is that 1906, 1906 is when the United States government forced the village of Oribe to accept education. And there were two sides, one for and one against. The one against, the tribal members that were against uh, the education system was that they said that if you are going to be educated in this foreign school system, education system, you're going to change the mind of our people. You're going to change the mind of that child. And that's exactly what happened. And you know what happened to that group that split away from that village? and they established their own village. The leaders of that group were sent to Alcatraz. They spent a whole, I'm, I'm not sure how long, I think it's more than a year. The other ones were marched from the Hopi land over to New Mexico 
border fortifiance is what they call that place. The other group was went, was sent. The leaders were sent. The religious leaders were sent to these two locations. But they stood their ground because today the Hopi's mind has changed. The young kids, their minds have changed. They don't think the Hopi way anymore. I was in that education system. I spoke Hopi when I was in elementary school. I was punished. They washed my mouth with that brown soap and they put me into a closet during class time. They put me in a closet and I, stand, I stood in there. I went through that. The other part that I went through was that punishment. If you spoke Hopi, you would have to put your hand out like this and they would slap it with a, with a, a board, a white, a white board. And I think some of the, some of the uh, Hopis that went to boarding schools, I think they went through the same situation. I went to the Phoenix Indian School in Phoenix. But so the Hopis in 1906 that stood against this education system that, that we have out there were, very, were correct. It changed the mind of the Hopi. The Hopi mind is different. I'm sure that it's the same for Native Americans. The way we think as Native Americans is a different way of thinking. We care for the land. Every time I go out and do my walk, I used, I used to run a lot. Every time now I go out and walk, but every time I go out and walk, or when I'm running and I run across, I see an insect running across. I see. I want some of your strength because I'm trying to get strong. Thank you for, and have a happy day. That's what I say to you. There's also a bug. It's a gray bug that you put on your lip. I mean, in, on your tongue. You put it on your tongue and you hold it into your, in your mouth for a while. That's medicine. The other animal that we use that, that's a common thing also is that we call that a matzakwa. Matzakwa is a horned toad. I mean horned, what do they call it? Horned, horned toad, it's not a, uh, can't remember the name. Yeah, horned toad, yeah. When you see one, you pick it up and you put it on your heart. That gives your heart strength. You ask him, I want to be strong. You say that in Hopi to them. I want to be strong. Put that on you. Then you release it and say, Kwa Kwa, thank you for your, for your uh, medicine to make me strong. So there's things that we, we don't do that anymore. The young kids don't do that. I don't even know how I was taught some of this or in, educated into this. And uh, the question there is how do you How do you uh, have the youth or something related to that? I was given the opportunity to respond and to ask questions. In the winter time, the elders would talk about stories and these stories would have a point. For instance, one story would be about res teaching respect. That's why you need to be, show this respect because of this story. In the end, they would tell you that. Then if you had a question, you would ask the question. Is that happening today? Hardly happening out there. That's why I was saying the knowledge has to be transferred from the elder to our youth. Change the thinking up here. And when you speak, I was told, you speak from the heart, not from here. You speak from the heart. Because when you speak from the heart, you speak the truth. So some of these teachings, 
you know, are there, but how do we, how do we deal that, how do, de how do we deal with that in teaching our, our youth from the research perspective, from the educational portion? There is, there's still a challenge there, but I think we're making headway. And that's what I really appreciate today is that I'm seeing that there's headway being made. We need our own researchers, Native Americans that can make a connection with what we're talking about here today. And those Hopis that stood up for, I don't want my child to be educated in this system because it changes the mind. We need to change that. We need to have our own schools. I'm promoting a Hopi, totally Hopi school on our reservation. And the initial training education will be teaching them about who we are as people. The knowledge that we have that's about the earth, plant. And you can teach the young children from Head Start on and Orient before the concepts of health and the way of living. One thing I want to uh, just point out is that, because uh, I think we're out of time, <laughs> is that if, and I think I said this before, if you want a healthy population, you have to make sure that they're eating healthy foods, not contaminated. And the other, uh, uh, not suggestion, but what was pointed out is that the health begins in the womb. So that means that the mother has to be healthy. We used to have births at home. Now we have them in hospitals. Why? because the mothers aren't healthy anymore, because there's complications that happen. I actually observed a birthing at home at my grandmother's house. I saw what they did. So it can happen, it really can, and that's where we need to go, that direction, to make our population healthy. Okay. Just in my experience with um, the question here that has been presented is that we, the director of the program is an elder, and then we have non-natives working um, as well, but then when we are asked to do restoration work or we're going to do food preservation or food preparation, for our preschool program or the uh, healthy snacks for the, for the employees, um, our community tables is, um, we're usually, um, especially when we're outdoors working, is we have, we bring along an elder, we bring, I'll bring my mother, we bring an auntie or, um, but we always start with a prayer, a circle, a circle time and we all speak what's on our hearts and what we want to get from today's work and then we end with one as well. And so that's always helped us to keep our elders engaged. And so the non-native, um, when there's enough of us all there, they just kind of don't have a choice but to, you know, just follow our lead. But they're always really respectful of that anyway. So um, just try to get that intergenerational um, happening at all times, and that's worked for us, so. Well, um, when I was a, a child in my formative years on the uh, Pine Ridge Reservation, um, we were taught, of course, to listen to our elders and, and be respectful. So that was a culture, so that's what we did. And uh, several of us, uh, families lived together, so we had a lot of playmates, our own cousins and siblings. And uh, every once in a while, we would have a question for uh, the grandmother or, or the aunties or our parents. And 
I don't know how they made that decision, but every once in a while they'd say, go, go ask Lala, who was our grandpa. And he, he was the one that drummed and sang to us every morning and every evening, and of uh, the prayers and, and the stories. And of course, the stories were, were about uh, our values. So one day he would sing about, sing about generosity or wisdom or courage, the seven values that we, we were taught. And you hear that over and over, and, and pretty soon it becomes part of your DNA. But um, so every once in a while we would be told to ask Lala. So we would, of course, but we had two older brother, uh, one uh, sibling and one cousin who wanted to get out there and play and didn't want to. So they would say, He's Ash. Uh, and then they would say, don't ask him, don't ask him, he's just going to tell us a story. And the, the idea of storytelling is valuable uh, because what, what the, the point of the story, somebody asked, what, is it, what was the point of, of what we do? And his point was to teach us one of those values, but he didn't say, well, number one value is wisdom. You know, he, he, he just told you a story about someone who had wisdom. And he made the stories interesting, of course, but they were long stories because our language is so descriptive. And so um, I appreciate that more and more as I get older, the way I was taught those things. And uh, actually, the Lakota students that I mentor today at the College of Nursing want that knowledge. And so they actually ask you. So I'm such, in such a good place to be doing that as a mentor for students who want to know. So uh, as time went on, I thought I better get my values straight and say it in a good way and say it in a story form, teaching the idea of listening to a story and then pulling your own point from it. So that's uh, exercise in critical thinking, inductive and deductive reasoning, all of that. So we were taught those things very early on in, in my history as a, as a Lakota person. So it is our responsibility as elders to, to teach what we know and understand. And uh, every one of you could do that because you all have experiences. You, you learned a lot right here at this conference the past two and a half days. Those you can make into a story and tell someone else, tell a youth or a child something, one segment from this conference, and that you will become uh, that vehicle, that conduit of, of learning and listening to each other in a respectful way. I had you do.
I don't think there's a better way to close than that incredible honor from our Fanu, um, from um, Aotearoa. So thank you so very much to our Maori relatives for offering such a blessing. So thank you. Thank you to our elders, your strength, your wisdom, your knowledge, and your continuous devotion for the health, the well-being, and forever loving our people. Thank you. <laughs>